that was willing to give herself to the Messenger والسلام, in marriage. The distinction between that and the rest of us, there is a formal process for the rest of us that entertains the guardian and everything else that goes along with the process. With the Messenger of Allah والسلام, if a woman would desire to marry the Messenger والسلام, she, could present, she could present herself for marriage and the Messenger والسلام, would be allowed to accept that woman for marriage. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned this is specifically for you. This verse in the Quran, Allah mentions, this is specifically for you. It's not for the rest of the believers. I want to give you this verse, inshallah ta'ala, so you can take it for your inam. No. No. No, I'm sheikh. It, it comes from and we're on طيب. it comes from and it stems from the kalima khasa specific when we get to the affairs of the aqwal the statements of the messenger والسلام, which also convey and carry over to quran we have the affair and this is very important we have the affair of that which is am and khas, general and specific. With the actions of the Messenger, والسلام, that which he is doing to draw near or close to Allah, where we see that there is proof, the ayah is clear proof. We don't even have to say authentic because we understand the entire Quran is authentic. It's not like we're dealing with the sunnah, where it's a question, is it an authentic hadith or not? The ayat is clear. This is specifically for you. And this is not for the rest of the believers. I believe I have that verse in the work of um, Sheikh what they mean. Inshallah ta'ala. But I will present it for you. It's from the Surah Al-Ahzab. But we also see when things are particular for the Messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam, it must be done through proof and evidence. Why are we saying that? Because we don't want an individual to see things that are done by the Messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam, and instantly entertain that's only for him until I'm told it is for me also. That is not the asl, as we presented previously. The asl, the foundation, the starting point, by default, everything that the Messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam, does is for us to follow and take as an example. Why? Because of the verse in the Quran where Allah Azza wa Jal mentions, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسْنَةٌ Indeed, in the Messenger of Allah, alayhi salatu wasalam, you have a beautiful example. If this was not the case, the scholars, as they mentioned, that there would be vain or idle or, or it would be talk of no benefit. It would be speech that has no virtue. And we know that the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is far removed from such qualities. That if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that indeed you have in the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam a beautiful example, the basis is that he is the example for us until it is made clear by proof and evidence it is only, solely, and specifically just for him. So the basis, if we ask and we inquire, and this is for review at this point, what is the basis? What is the start point when we deal with the actions of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Do we entertain them as actions for us to follow 
Or do we wait for a text that tells us that it is not specifically for him that we are now allowed to follow? What would we say? If we are asked, what is the basis? What is the starting point? When dealing with the actions of the Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, are we to take his actions as an example to follow without restriction from starting? Or is it the opposite? We wait and say that is specifically for him. We don't move until he tells us, no, do as I have done. Which of the two? What is the starting point? We take the first point, Sheikh Yahya. Okay, I'll come back, inshallah, Sheikh Zaid. Which would mean the first one? Any of the sisters? The first one, and this is correct. The asal, the first base that we operate and we move from, it is that the actions of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam are actions for us to follow, to emulate, and to put into our lives. That is the asl. That is the starting point of all of the actions of the Messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam. Whether he's in Medina, whether he's in Mecca, whether he's on Hajj, whether he's performing salat, whether he's getting married, every action of the Messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam, where he is drawing near or close to Allah Azza wa Jal, the basis of where you and I start, we take them as an example for us. We take him as the role model. We don't look at him as a star and say that lifestyle is just for him. When he tells us that you can also partake in it and do the same, then we would follow. We do not do that. We take him as the role model. And we say, what you do to draw near and close to Allah Azza wa Jal, we're going to do the same thing until you tell us that, no, this is just for me. Or until we are told by Quran, that is just for him. The basis of where we start, we do as the messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam. Moving forward. Explaining some of the actions of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we're going to go back to this work, al waraqat with the explanation of Sheikh Fozan, where the author of the work, he mentions, فَإِنْ دَلَ الدَّلِيلِ عَلَى الْإِخْتِصَاصِ بِهِ يُحْمَلْ عَلَى الْإِخْتِصَاصِ And if the proof indicates to us, that is, it is specifically and solely for the Messenger, والسلام, then hold it and carry it to be specifically for him. And if it does not indicate that it is specifically or solely for the Messenger, والسلام, then do not restrict it and hold it solely to be for him. He continues and he says, Sheikh <clears throat> Taymin, I mean, uh, Sheikh Fozan, he explains and he says, فَإِذَا كَانَ الْفِعْلُ عَلَى وَجْحِ الْقُرْبَةِ وَالطَّاعَةِ So now we have, if there is an action, it is upon عَلَى الْوَجْحِ And it has been inquired as to, does وَجْحِ here mean Base, and we say no. Waj here means avenue, perspective, or manner. Like when we deal with other affairs of fiqh or usul al fiqh, wajhul istidlal. What is the way that you are utilizing your proof and evidence? You have that which is dalil, Quran or Sunnah. You have to
من السياق from the from the context itself from the expression itself this is very important very important that when you're looking at a jumla when you're looking at a sentence or a phrase or a term you're looking at the siyaq you're looking at the context of what is being presented ala wajhi not upon the face of obedience or drawing near or close ala wajhi here it is being used as what is the wajh what is the manner what is the perspective what is the avenue of how you are seeing if it is of obedience or of drawing near or close to Allah azza wa jal no no this is just this is just clear this is just basic if, if you're reading the average uh, sentence or you're reading the average verse throughout the Quran and you're just looking at the 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 siyaq how is the sentence being presented to bring across the meaning what is being expressed inside of the jumla so here this is ala wajh ta'a wal qurba now we are upon the avenue the messenger of allah alayhi salatu wasalam is doing something to draw near and close to allah azza wa jal and it is of obedience it is not something that is specifically and solely for him as the shaykh he's mentioning here for either can al fi'lu ala wajh al qurbati wa ta'a if it is upon the avenue of drawing near and close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and of obedience wa la dalil ala al ikhtisas fihi and there's no proof or evidence that it is something specifically or solely for the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam fa fihi khilaf so now you're going to have the scholars are going to differ now so what is being presented now what is being discussed it is an action that the messenger alayhi salatu wasalam is doing of obedience and drawing near to allah azza wa jal it's not something that is specifically or solely for him which means that this conversation entertains you and i all of us sheikh sheikh fozan he says fa fihi khilaf there is difference now amongst the scholars concerning those actions that the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is doing how are we to view them wa mithaluhu ma warada fi sharih ma warada an sharih ibn hani qala sa'altu aisha radiyallahu ta'ala anha bi ayyi shay'in kana yabda'u ar-rasul alayhi salatu wasallam idha dakhala baytah qala bis-siwaq Now you see where it's going. Wa alaikum salam. Is OBD? I should have an E here. Tell you. Just like as we get to when we're looking at the word Ain in Arabic, Ain, Ain, it can be an eye, it can be a river, it can be a spy, right? Ain, I'm sah. It's very important, especially when you're dealing with things that are. Am al khas. The avenue, the manner, the pers- exactly the manner, the perspective, or the the understanding of how you see something. So when we have, <clears throat> when we get to a particular position, and you bring me a verse from the Quran, that's your dalil person may ask you ma wajhul istidlali bil ayah how are you using this ayah are you using this ayah to show me that there is something of obligation 
that there is something of recommendation, there is something of prohibition, there is something of abrogation. They will ask you, ما وجه الاستدلال? Yes, we see it that this is what you are utilizing for your proof. But what do you see in it of proof? Because not every piece that is presented as dalil is dalil. You see? Even if it's the ayah from the Quran. Because they may say the avenue of how you're utilizing it, it is incorrect. And the pushback could either be the, the verse is abrogated. The pushback could be that verse is general. There's another verse that specifies it now, that restricts it. So not every piece of text that's being presented as dalil is dalil. You know what I'm saying? Yes, that's the dalil of the mas'ala. We want to see if you can complete the process. No. 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 You could have, this is from what Sheikh Yahya is mentioning, understanding this term waj and the manner of how it's being utilized and bringing this particular example as wajhul istidlal. Istidlal, you say, okay, what is your, your proof that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is without beginning, without end? Lam yalid wa lam yulad. You know what I'm saying? Oh, that's your proof. You know what I'm saying? Ma istidlal bi ayah. How are you utilizing this proof? وَأَمَّا الْإِسْتِدَلَالُ بِالْآيَةِ لَأَنَّ اللَّهَ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَالَى قَالْ لَمْ يَلِدْ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was not born. There's no beginning process for him. There's no beginning process for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. هُوَ الْأَوَّلُ وَالْآخِرُ He is the first and he is the last. He is the first without beginning. He is the last without end. So this would be the Wajhul istidlal. This will be the manner of how we utilize the verse. It may be possible that a person may bring a verse, and the verse that they bring is abrogated. So we would say now, your dalil, what you are utilizing as proof, is that not complete the process. It's possible that the dalil that a person may present. The verse may be Am. It's general. There's another verse that restricts it. And we would say, yes, it is a verse from the Quran. It is recited. But the ruling inside of it now has now been restricted. That we don't use the generality of that verse, except that when it is being presented, it is restricted by another verse. The allegorical or the uh, straight up context of the text is also discussed when we have the affairs of that which is muhkam um, and mutashabih. As Allah mentions in Surah Al-Ali Imran that the verses, he says, no, no, no. That it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that has revealed upon the Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam ayat that are muhkam, they are clear and concise. Hunna ummul kitab wa ukharu mutashabiha. And the rest of them, they are vague and they are obscure. We don't understand. Clearly, what is the meaning of them without returning them to other verses? So a person may bring you an obscure verse, and they may utilize it as their proof, and we say that verse does not complete the process for what you're utilizing it for until it is now given clarity by another verse that is clear, ruling, and guiding, and judging within itself. If you go to... Uh, Surah Al-Ali Amran, which is the 13th 
third chapter of the Quran. I'm not sure. It's in the first verses. Number seven, Akid. I'll go with what the Sheikh says, inshallah. So I have to blind follow the Sheikh, inshallah. <laughs> so these are all affairs that when you are studying Usul al Fiqh, when you're studying Tafsir and so forth, these affairs, they come to light. The affair of that which is Am and Khas, that which is Muhkam and Mutashabih, these particular affairs, you're going to say, how are you utilizing that verse or that hadith for your proof? You cannot just present an ayah or a hadith and say, this is my proof, the argument is over. You will say, no, it does not work this way. We have to see if what you're saying completes the process. Because it is possible that a verse or a hadith can be used incorrectly. And Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, he says that when there is difference of opinion between individuals and the process is taking place and you present what is your proof, your dalil for the mas'ala and it does not complete the process, you will say, yes, that is the verse, but it is not sound to be utilized for this particular issue. He now says at that junction, your proof has become my proof because I've utilized it as a means to negate your discussion. You see what's going on? Not, and this is very important, not every time an ayah is presented, even if it surface value deals with the issue, does not substantiate proof and evidence. How are you utilizing the verse? How are you utilizing the hadith? You may be looking at a narration, you may be looking at an ayat that is specific and not realizing that it has been made general by other texts. It is very important to understand, and this is why the scholars, when they, within this work of al waraqat they detail for you the qualities of an individual that is mujtahid, that is able to make ijtihad, the alat, the tools that have to be at the expense of an individual to do so from the Arabic language, from the affairs of usul, from the affairs of hadith, understanding the signs of hadith. He himself has to know what's authentic and what's not, or else he's muqallid. He's blind following like I'm blind following Sheikh Mustafa. Yes, that's the verse. He has to understand tafsir of Quran, understand the revelation, understand what's abrogated from what's not abrogated, understand what's restricted from what's not restricted. Other than this, the affair of making ijtihad from an individual like this, it's not sound. Just like when you're doing math, even if the answer adds up, you're in disobedience by speaking about the deen on affairs that you don't have knowledge of, that you're not suited to do so. And I'm going to stretch it but so far and then stop without names and faces. But when you see that there are fatawa that emanate, whether it is myself, whether it is any other student, American-born, foreign, Domestic with us now, international. Whenever you see any fatwa that comes from a student on a particular affair, and it is not known that this individual is suited or capable to make and derive such a statement, the red flag should shoot to the stars. To say, yes, everybody can get an, an issue correct haphazardly once in a while. But this does not mean that you are suited. And this does not mean it is to be accepted. And we want to say that because there have been fatawa that have been passed within the history of our communities. That when we look at the individuals and we will say, at the status and time that is emanating from you, 
Do we really think that you are a mujtahid, that you are an individual capable, suited, qualified to make ijtihad? When at the same time, if we turned around and said, do you have ijazat? Do you even have any certificates or any uh, stamps of approval from the scholars to teach tawheed? To teach Arabic? To teach fiqh? And then you turn around and you issue fatawa that unsettle the roots of communities? People have to go back and start looking at these issues and say, where did these issues take us? Where are we now from the residue of these issues? And these, these affairs all go back to the individual that is suitable and capable of making these particular decisions. And we're saying this because these are some of the issues that you learn and you're presented and you become abreast with that you put in your tool chest. But because it's in your tool chest, doesn't necessarily mean you're qualified. Yes, we're to a certain degree, we're qualified. I mean, we're, we're abreast on certain avenues of the science of hadith. Are any of us going to open up a book and now look at Abu Dawood and say, that's not authentic? That's authentic. Kalla. No. But why is it that statements that may emanate from whoever the individual is and it's clear that's a fatwa from you? We don't see all the, no mashayikh saying what you're saying because if that was the case, we would not even see you. We would see the shaykh. But we see the mas'ala and we see you attached to it. And at the time we see it attached to you, we do not see this individual capable of possessing all of these qualities at this time, very highly unlikely. And if that is the case, we will say at the same time, well, where are the ijazat? Where did they send you back qualified to teach Quran, Arabic, hadith, fiqh, tafsir, wahakatha? But then you issue a fatwa that unsettles and unroots the community, communities, brothers and sisters, and it goes on for years and decades. And none of us think to look back and say, what was the source of it? Were you qualified to do so? And then everybody at this time, I, said, I have to take your statement and say, okay, if, if you say it's seven to seven, I don't have to take a statement if you say, oh, it's X, Y, and Z, and this is X, Y, and Z, and I feel, you know, I don't really feel much of qualified to make this assessment. I can't let you put that yoke on my neck. Because that's what taqlid is. That's what blind following is. And taking a verse and so forth, if you say a seven, yeah, you say a seven. It doesn't change the arrangement or order of the Quran. But if we're talking about an affair from the deen, a fatwa, a verdict being issued, you can do this, you can't do that. This takes the ruling of this, this takes the ruling of that. And it affects and it alters the lifestyle and the history and the relationships of believers till present day. We say, how much credibility have you given an individual like this? Nam ya sheikh. No. You say to yourself, well, what is the what is the point of that? you make it to how people get to be unqualified. It just goes to show us that they start unqualified. It's all of us. It's the asal of insan. He's ignorant. Wakana al insan jahula. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned Huwa ladi akhrajakum min butuni ummahatikum la ta'lamuna shay'a. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that has extracted you from the wombs of your mother not knowing anything. And he mentioned in another verse, وَمَا أُوْتِيْتُمْ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا You have not been given anything of knowledge except very little. And it is a, 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 a process of utitum. You're given. You're not embedded. We're born with blood. We're not born with knowledge. You're not born with the right to speak about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's deen. This is something that you build and you acquire. And then you're giving that acknowledgement. Especially when you're taking the tariq and the, the traditional path of studying amongst the people of knowledge and so forth like this. They're going to accredit you. They're going to acknowledge you to be able to do hakada and so forth. Even if we add that into the discussion and we say, this fatwa that you've passed, who has sanctioned you to give fatawa? And it has unsettled lives of individuals to this very day. These are the things that we have to start looking at the affairs from these particular eyes, as you're mentioning. And there is going to be something that I do want you to return back to from the work that we did of Sheikh Al-Abani once this is presented to bring the, uh, the amthal, the examples, and so forth, if you would say. But here, the fi'lun mujarrad, the mere action of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Within this work, the Messenger والسلام, has done a deed or he has done an action upon an avenue of drawing near and close to Allah. Within the work, the Shaykh is mentioning that his Ashab, his companions, he is of the madhab of Imam al Shafi'i, the author of Al Warqat. He mentions and he says, <clears throat> Is this mine or yours? Oh, it is mine. Okay. He says, فَيُحْمَلْ عَلَى الْوُجُوبِ عِنْدَ بَعْدِ أَصْحَابِنَا That some of our companions will say, that state, that action of the messenger, that deed of the messenger, some of our companions from the, from the madhab of Imam al-Shafi'i, they will say that action is for wujub, meaning that you as well are obligated to do that deed. And then he mentions women ashabina man qala yuhmal ala nadab. And there are some of our companions from the madhab of Imam al Shafi'i that would say that no, that action is upon recommendation. Women whom man qala fihi. And there are some of them that say no, you wait until the affair becomes clear. So there are three positions that are being presented from an action that is presented by the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam or deed from the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Some of the people of knowledge, they're going to look at it and they're going to say that action is of obligation for you. And from amongst the positions that they're going to come from, the wudj of where they're going to come from, the verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, وَمَا أَتَاكُمُ الرَّسُولِ فَخُذُوا What the Messenger of Allah والسلام, gives you, then take it. وَالْأَمْرُ لِلْوُجُوبِ And the command is for obligation with the majority of the scholars of Usul. So this is an affair that you will see that because the command is for obligation and that the messenger, والسلام, if he's doing a deed and he is the one that we are to follow, there are some of the people of knowledge that would say it's an obligation to do those deeds. Then he mentioned there are some of our companions that say, Yuhmal <clears throat> ala nadab. Is going to be held upon recommendation and that it is desired for you to do so, but it's not of obligation. Then he mentions that there are some of the companions of this particular madhab of fiqh that they would say, Yutawakafi, wait until clarity presents itself concerning which of the two avenues is most weightiest, most weightiest, and then follow through. Sheikh Fozan. حفظ الله تعالى he says here فإذا كان الفعل على الوجه القربة والطاعة ولا دليل على الاختصاص ففيه خلاف and then he mentions ومثاله ما ورد عن شريح ابن هاني قال سألت عائشة رضي الله تعالى عنها بأي شيء كان يبدع الرسول عليه الصلاة والسلام إذا دخل بيته 
قال بالسواك. This hadith where Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she was asked, what thing would the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam begin or do when he entered the house? What would be the first thing that he would do when he would enter the house? And she mentioned that he would utilize the siwak. The utilization of the siwak in this narration from Aisha, she's detailing for us, this was an action he did when entering the house. So now if we take that and we refer it back to those three positions that Sheikh Fozan just mentioned in this work from the author, would we hold when you enter your house, it is of obligation to use the siwak, would you hold to use the siwak when entering the house to be upon recommendation? Or would you take the position mutawakkif? I'm going to stop. I'm not going to utilize it until it's made clear to me if it's obligation or if it's recommendation. You would take recommendation. That's recommendation. Toyib, anyone else? I'm not going to say there's a right or wrong because as you are seeing, there are ulama, there are scholars that would tell you it is of obligation. So I'm not, yes, this, this work is being presented to clarify you the affairs of the action of the messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam. It is from a scholar. He's detailing for you the position of the madhab of Imam al-Shafi'i concerning these particular affairs. And he's telling you that there are from amongst his ashab, from other scholars, on the madhab of Imam al-Shafi'i that would say it is an obligation in this example to use the siwak because it is an action of the messenger alayhi salatu wasalam وَمَا أَتَاكُمُ الرَّسُولُ فَخُضُوهُ This is going to be the substantiation that they would utilize to say it is an obligation to use the siwak when you enter into your house. Why? Because it's an action of the messenger alayhi salatu wasalam it's an avenue that is being utilized to draw near and close. The utilization of the siwak is not just for the cleansing or the purification of the mouth, but as by narration, it is pleasing to your Lord. That which is pleasing to your Lord substantiates the baseline of ibadah. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, radiyallahu anhum wa radu an. There's ibadah attached. It's not just the mere effect of I'm brushing my teeth. It's not just the mere effect of I'm putting on my clothes. It's not just the mere effect of I'm eating or I'm drinking, whatever the situation may be. We're dealing with an affair of ibadah when dealing with the siwak. As the ulama, they mentioned that narration that it is a cleansing of the mouth and it is a, a, is a pleasing to your Lord. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with something, this is showing you the baseline of ibadah is attached to it. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahim ta amongst the various definitions of ibadah, he has what is probably the most common and most well-known definition of ibadah. And it is that which is of um, any statement or action that is pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the servant does to draw near and close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it lets you know and it gives you the understanding that that which Allah Azza wa Jal is pleased with, whether it is a statement or action, it is ibadah. So we see from narration, the siwak is something that pleases Allah Azza wa Jal. So it lets you know and it gives you the understanding and the baseline, it is ibadah to use the siwak. It's not just a means solely of cleansing the mouth. No, I'm sure. That is true. We're going to give you the statements of the people of knowledge. And as always, you know, you will be able to uh, determine and decipher for yourself and so forth. This is the beauty and the purpose of this class to educate you, 
with the usul in light and hand in hand with the text so that if something becomes clear to you that that is the correct position, then that is what at that junction you're responsible for when that knowledge comes. And it may be possible that you may go one particular avenue and let's say have your wife goes a different avenue. She's accountable for what has reached her from the understanding of what she has. And likewise the sheikh and likewise myself and so forth. And we all may have varying positions, but we want to give you the usul. We want to give you the tools. When the texts are presented, now you see how to start analyzing things and breaking things down to put, to put yourself in a position of, is it A, B, or C? Based off of your breakdown and your analysis and that which is at your tool chest, you'll say from the various positions of the people of knowledge, I feel comfortable with C, despite Sheikh al Albani may be on A. And you don't feel no hardship. You don't feel no weightiness in your heart. I'm going against the shape because you don't see the shape. You see the usul. You see the text. And at the same time, you understand that there are people of knowledge that have explained this to you and presented this to you. And this, this is why this is the most weightiest. But you're now in line to feel more comfortable and accepting of the position and get to a point where you may be able to challenge certain statements and positions presented by the people of knowledge based off of what? Wajhul istidalad. The Sheikh utilized that particular um, hadith for his argumentation, and we don't hold that hadith to be authentic. So there's no way I could follow him on this now. It's not about the issue of the Sheikh, it's about the issue of the science of hadith now. Well, you know, as far as the mujtahid, um, for what is aligned and arranged for us at this particular time, we're not going to go um, towards that particular avenue or that particular junction at this time. Really, these classes right now are an introduction. They're preparatory for Balogh al-Maram. As Balogh al-Maram is a book of hadith. It's arranged upon the categories of fiqh. So a lot of people just navigate towards it and say it's a book of fiqh. That's not the case. It's a book of hadith. So you have to be abreast on how to engage hadith. First and foremost, it is arranged upon uh, the chapters of fiqh. So you have to have some affair of how to engage fiqh, usul al-fiqh, these particular affairs. And these are the two that we have engaged so far. But those are specifics that come down the line. Those... Those topics, you need discussions for them. And maybe not a night lecture. You need discussions for them so people become abreast upon the reality of certain affairs. And they say, you know what? At this junction moving forward, I'll be able to put certain things in place. When certain things come, we'll know where to draw the line. And we'll know where other individuals are crossing that line. 
especially when we see that certain affairs are going to be more severe than others. It may be one thing the average Muslim, the average nine to five Muslim, he gives a fatwa to another individual. And it's just between them two. No doubt, there's clear wrong. But the ramifications are restrictive. It's different when individuals are on different levels and they do so at the same time. And now it's widespread. You're affecting individuals on a greater level, more so than something maybe a husband may do to his wife. That the companions they did with the other companion. And they advised him, we see no way for you except but to take a bath. And he died. As opposed to an individual that may give a fatwa and it's widespread within the community. It doesn't just affect one particular individual. So these are things that are very, very crucial that they come to light, they come to surface. And this isn't about individuals, it's about the process. That's what it is. We want individuals to be aware and abreast on the process. So if at any junction, whether it is even yourself, you're able to check yourself and say, no, 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 I, I can't go there. You're able to check your ashab, your companions, you know, your al, your family, your friends, if you would say, quote unquote, friends, because there's no friends in the religion, for those that didn't know. There's no friends. There's no friends. You thought you were my friend? You my man? I'll give you something better than that. You my brother. Until the death. You to my death, inshallah. Oh, yeah. It's different between, if you would say, a Sadiq. Right? The difference between an Akh, a brother, and a Sadiq. And you say, oh, this is my friend. No, 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 no. In the Malmu'minuna Ikhwa, we are brothers. This is the baseline Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has established. Can't go beneath this. You cannot deprive me of this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala establishes between me and you. Right? The Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he mentioned that if I was to take a friend, I would take Abu Bakr. What he mentioned is the Akuwa of Iman. Is the brotherhood of Iman. That if the Messenger of Allah والسلام, did not even take Abu Bakr as a friend, that is the example for us. Our baseline is brotherhood. Brotherhood and sisterhood. Cannot get any greater than that except that our bond of Iman grows with it at the same time. The friendships that individuals have is built off of worldly desires, worldly gains, worldly pleasures, temporary. No. Okay, so this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to continue this discussion. And that, for you, is going to be your homework. Because there's going to be homework for everyone else. But that one, that's going to be yours specifically. Because that's something that the Messenger of Allah, والسلام, is doing upon a wudge of obedience and drawing near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That which he's performing at night before going to bed. Right? Protection. Protection. Right? But now the issue is obligation, recommendation, or the individual just says, I'm not doing anything. Halt until things become clear. We have one position where it is of obligation because of whatever the Messenger of Allah gives you, then take it. With this affair of the siwak, Sheikh Fozan continues and he says, Fasiwak and the Dukhul al-Bayti fi'lun mujarrad. 
utilizing the sawak when the individual enters his house, he says, Fi'lun mujarrad. This is very important that you understand a mere action of the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Lam yurid bihi qawlun. There is no statement that associates itself with that action. The Messenger of Allah, and this is very important, we're starting to detail to you and give you the framework of what is just a mere action. Aisha said when the messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam, would enter the house, the first thing that he would begin with was utilizing the siwak. It's a mere action. Sheikh Fozan is saying, lam yarid bihi qawl. There's no statement associated with that action. Wafa'alahu ala wajh al-qurba. And he did do it upon an avenue of drawing near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Fahada fihi khilaf ala aqwal. And he said, this is where there is difference. The statement has been mentioned by the author in three categories. And those were the categories that we've mentioned. But that was the example. The Messenger of Allah, Ali Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, just utilizing the siwak, it's his actions. It's on the actions that fall upon the branch of drawing near and close to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. There's nothing that shows that it's specific for him. But how do we hold the utilization of the siwak? There are some scholars that are going to go different ways with it. It's just a mere action. Lam yarid bihi qawl. There's no statement. He didn't say, إِذَا دَخْلَ أَحَدُكُمْ بَيْتَهَا When any of you enter his house, فَبْدَعُوا siwak. Then begin with the siwak. That's different. It's just a mere action of the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Sheikh Fozan, to conclude with his position on this issue, he says, وَالْرَاجِحْ وَاللَّهُ أَعْلَمْ هُوَ الْقَوْلْ بِالنَّدْبِ Whenever you hear this term as well, as we mentioned to you, the jamhur, or you hear, what's sahih, what is most sound, whenever you hear, وَالْرَاجِحْ, what is most weightiest, is letting you know it's an issue of difference amongst the scholars. Sheikh Fozan is saying, وَالْرَاجِحْ, what is most weightiest with him, and he says, Wallahu a'lam, and Allah knows best, huwa al-qawl bin nadbi. It is the statement of recommendation. It is the statement of recommendation. We're going to give you a little bit more clarity now from Shaykh Uthaymeen, rahimahullah ta'ala, upon his poetry of usul al-fiqh. Shaykh Uthaymeen, he says here, al-qism al-rabi' the fadl. That is, the, that is also from amongst the proof. That is also from amongst the proof. But that narration being presented as is with him entering the house. It is possible that a person may say, well, I'm going to differentiate between the two incidents. Whether it's entering the house or utilizing it for wudu. You see? So if we peel back a layer and say, well, we just want to look at fi'lun mujarrad, just the mere action itself, if we still held out that the rajih was that it was upon nadbu, recommendation, it would put us at the same conclusion as an individual utilizing it for the salat or for the, the wudu. So yeah. Sheikh Uthaymeen, rahimah ta'ala, he mentions here, categorizing the actions of the Messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam, al-qism al-rabi' the fourth category. Ma fa'alahu al-nabiyu sallallahu alayhi wasalam fi'lan mujarradan. That which the Messenger of Allah, alayhi salatu wasalam, has done, just a mere simple action. Yadharu fihi ta'abud lillahi azza wa jal. It is clear that you see from it that he's worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by that action. فَهَذَا وَاجُمْ عَلَيْهِ 
This is obligatory upon the messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam, li ajli al-iblaq, because he must convey. So pay attention to how he's categorizing the obligation upon the messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam. At this stage, he's saying that it's an obligation upon the messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam. Why? Because he's commanded to convey. Right? Convey that which is revealed to you from your Lord. So the messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam, even if he's going to reveal and to relay something to us that is a recommendation, because he has to relay it, it's an obligation upon him at that time, that particular action to relay. But it's an obligation upon him to relay it to us. This is clear? Tell you. وبعد أن يبلغ الأمة يكون ندبا له ولنا. And after he conveys it and relays it to us, to the Ummah, it becomes recommended for him and recommended for us. مثال, an example, as Siwak and the Dakhul al Bayt. He's going to give you the same example. He's going to give you more clarification, inshallah. فقد كان عليه الصلاة والسلام إذا دخل بيته أول ما يبدع به the Messenger of Allah والسلام, the first thing he used to begin with when he entered his house was the siwak. This is a mere action from the Messenger. This is not of an obligation. However, it is recommended because it is worship. And if an individual was to say, in the tasawwuk, utilizing the siwak, tanzif, walaysa bi ibada, it is cleansing. It's not worship. Kulna, we would say, bel ibada. No, it is worship. La anna Rasul alayhi salatu wasalam kala, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi salam kala, he said, as siwak, mutahiran lil fahm, that the, uh, the siwak, it is a cleansing and a purification of the mouth. And it is a pleasing and something of enjoyment for your Lord. He mentions that this narration has already proceeded within the work. So I don't have the taqreej for you at this particular time, but we can find it for you, inshallah ta'ala. He mentions, and this is another example, وَمِنْ ذَلِكَ أَيْضًا and as well. فعل النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم مع عبد الله بن عباس رضي الله تعالى عنهما. The action of the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم with Abdullah ibn Abbas. حين وقف عن يساره في صلاة الليل متم به. When Abdullah ibn Abbas رضي الله تعالى عنهما, he stood on the left side of the Messenger عليه الصلاة والسلام for the nighttime salat. Are we all familiar or? On the same page with this occurrence? For those that are not, Abdullah, what's the companion's name here again? Um, Abdullah ibn Abbas is related to the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was with the Messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam, at night. The Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, stood to pray. Abdullah ibn Abbas, radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, he stood to pray with the Messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam. This narration is also what is utilized for the proof that an individual can join someone in the prayer without the person having the intent that that person begins the prayer with you. That a person can now say, I don't have to start the prayer with the Imam. And the Imam can start the prayer without me and I can join him because his intent is now to do what? To pray munfarid by himself. As we mentioned from the class on the prayer, you're in one of three categories. You're either munfarid, you're by yourself, you're the Imam, or you're the congregation. The individual that's praying by himself now has to change the niyyah 
to lead someone in prayer or else he's still moon -fretted. But you see from the narration as it's going to present itself, the Messenger of Allah والسلام, was leading him in the prayer. And it becomes obvious by the actions that took place that he did not continue to pray by himself and distance Abdullah ibn Abbas from himself or move himself from Abdullah ibn Abbas. So, you, so this is from amongst the proof that the people of knowledge mentioned that you could join someone in prayer that didn't have the intent to lead you in prayer. So with this narration thus far, the Prophet والسلام, is praying the nighttime prayer. Abdullah ibn Abbas anhuma, he stands to pray with the messenger والسلام, but where does he stand? He goes to his left hand side. So at this point now, for the most part, the nine to five Muslim knows you stand on the right. But Abdullah ibn Abbas, he stood on the left. Everybody's on the same page to this point? You said no? <laughs> Allahu A'lam. It's going to detail itself. But we don't know why he went there. You're going to create a lot of homework for yourself, Shay. <laughs> so he stood on the left side of the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, being led, being led. Mu'tamman bihi. Fa'akhadha nabiyu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam bi ra'sihi bin wara'ihi. The messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he took his head, he took hold of the head of Abdullah ibn Abbas from behind him. Right? فَأَدَارَهُ عَنْ يَمِينِ And he placed him on his left. So this is what's happening. The messenger on his right. The messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is praying the nighttime salat. Abdullah ibn Abbas stands on his left. The messenger of Allah, alayhi salatu wasalam, takes hold of his head from behind him and pulls him to his right side. Everybody's on the same page? Tayyib. This is a mere action of the Messenger. It is not narrated or it is not spoken from the Messenger. That he commanded that whoever prays on the left side of the Imam and Yauda ila Yamini that return him to the right side. Do you see what's going on now? This action of the messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam, it took place upon an action of obedience, an avenue of obedience and drawing near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because he's praying. He's doing something concerning the prayer. It's not something that we will look at and say, oh no, that's specific to the messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam. Why? Because that's not the starting point. We don't start there. Until the text comes that says that that was specific for him, with him, and that incident, then we say, no, we continue on. And we say, that could be the case of you and I, if we are praying together. It's general. So now we see that Abdullah ibn Abbas stood on the left. The messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam, did not tell him, move to my right. He did not say after the narration, if any of you pray, and someone stands on your left, then move to his right or move them to your right. Like we have with the narration of the sutra, where he tells you, stop them. It's not just a mere action. He tells you, stop them, fight them. But in this narration, the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, all he did was move him. We don't have no statement directing us telling us what to do. It's only your action. The actions are on three categories, basically, in this situation, where it's upon the avenue of obedience and drawing near. It's not specific for him. We know it's for us. It's just a mere action. Is this a situation that you're going to look at and you're going to say, oh, no, that's an obligation? Or are you going to say, you know what? It's a recommendation. Or are we going to say, we're not going to take a position until things become clear to us. 
This is why with usul, it helps determine for you because the people of knowledge have positions on that narration on what you are to do. What is the correct position? Shaykh Wutaymin, rahimah ta'ala, he continues and he says here, فَيَكُونَ الْوَقُوفِ عَلَى يَمِينُ الْإِمَامِ So it is now that standing on the right side of the imam, إِذَا كَانَ الْمَأْمُومِ وَاحِدًا سُنَّةً That if the congregation is only one, is sunnah. To stand on the right-hand side of the imam, if there's only one person in the congregation, he says that it is sunnah. وَلَيْسَ بِوَاجِبْ And that it, follow, follow through. And that it's not of, Shaykh what they mean. And that it's not of obligation. Again, فَيَقُونَ الْوَقُوفَ عَلَى يَمِينَ الْإِمَامِ So to stand on the right side of the imam. إِذَا كَانَ الْمَأْمُومِ If the congregation, now and this is just one person by this narration, is only one. Sunnah, it is sunnah. وَلَيْسَ بِوَاجِبٍ And it is not of obligation. لَأَنَّهُ لَمْ يَكُنْ فِيهِ إِلَّا فِعْلٌ إِلَّا مُجَرُّدَ فِعْلِ النَّبِيِّ صلى الله عليه وسلم Because inside of this, all we have is the mere action of the Messenger عليه الصلاة والسلام وَالْفِعْلٌ مُجَرُّدُ لَا يَدُلُّ عَلَى الْوُجُوبِ It is not indicative of obligation. This is something, this is, this is why it's very important to understand these affairs of the sunnah. Because as we mentioned now, what is this going to do? It's going to realign the scope of sunnah with you. And if a person, in a situation where that happens, and maybe the person wasn't on that side, and they would say, Akhi, you can't, you can't pray there, that's not correct. They might even heighten the conversation to, you have to pray over now because it was an obligation. We say the issue of where you're resting the conversation upon of obligation established off of what? A mere action of the messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam, that he did not tell us, which is the, the highest of status, of explanation, of clarity, of expression, of interpretation, that he did not tell us if any one of you prays and an individual comes to stand on your left, then move them. That's different. That's clear. That's wadih. But if it's a mere action, the Messenger of Allah, alayhi salatu wasalam, just by a mere action, if that was the case, and you said, okay, well, what happens with the siwak now based off the narration of Aisha? Are you also now telling me based off of a mere action that the siwak was an obligation because things have to align once you set the principle nothing escapes the principle except by dalil so, say it again in this situation if there's one person praying with the imam it is the sunnah to stand on the right and it is not obligatory for the individual to stand on the right. No. Say it again. There are two actions, if you would say, but they fall along the track that ultimately put you at mere action. 
because we could change we could change the action and we we could make it dealing with something of um any other act of ibadah of the messenger والسلام, and then say well this is the act in that degree of worship and say well it's two we say no 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 it's one it's an action that the messenger والسلام, is doing not accompanied by speech it's just a mere action so the beauty of this now is being that we've covered the work of Sheikh Al-Albani, I want each of you to go back to the work of Sheikh Al-Albani and I want you to find me one, two, or three, and there are one, two, or three examples of mere actions of the Messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam, inside of the salat. That is not, and these are, these are going to be details of the salat because this movement was a detail of the nighttime salat that took place in this incident. So these are going to be actions. These are not going to be statements because we're dealing with af'al and we're dealing with actions that don't have any clarity behind them. From the work of Sheikh Al-Albani, I want you to bring me one, two, or three descriptions of the salat. That the Messenger of Allah, alayhi salatu wasalam, when he prayed, he prayed like this. From the examples that you bring, I want you to see what are the rulings associated and attached to it. From the work of Sheikh Al-Albani, the mere actions of the Messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam, that are within the description of his prayer. And I'm going to give you one. I'm going to give you one. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala an, anha. It is. It is. No. No. She mentioned that when he would be in Rukur, that his back would be leveled and that his that if water was to be placed on it, it would stay firm, but that his head would be parallel with his back, it would not be dipped, nor would it be inclined. Mere action of the messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam. No narration that tells us from this work of Sheikh al-Albani that when you pray, position your head like this. As he told the individual that prays, when you stand for the prayer, face the Qibla, then perform the takbir. Then recite that which is easy from you from the mother of the book, Wahakada. Those are all detailed explanations of the prayer by statement. Inside of that, he does not mention the leveling of the head. So you will see, even within the work of Sheikh al-Albani, even within his summarization of it, he does not hold that to be an obligation. That's a sunnah. Why? It's a mere action. It's a mere action. But it's a mere action of who? The one that said, Sallu kama ra'aytumuni usalli. However, yet not all of the actions of his prayer are upon the same level. Some are upon obligation, some are upon recommendation. Right? So, how do we know the difference between the two? These usul detail for us. And this is why I mentioned at the beginning of the class as well, if I'm not mistaken. That all of the styles of sitting are sunnah. All of the styles of sunnah. No matter which one if you do one of the four that we detail. If you did one when it was supposed to be four, sunnah. You've left off the sunnah. If you did two when it was supposed to be three, you left off the sunnah. You're not going to find the narration that tells you when you sit, then sit on your left hip. Put your right foot under your, your, your right calf or between your calf and your thigh. Raise the foot. These were all observations of the companions of fi'lun mujarrad. This is why the people in knowledge, they say, those are actions of the sunnah. It's not of obligation. But I want everyone, because we studied this work, so now we're going to start meshing and overlapping and intertwining some of these affairs. And I want you to start to see from those actions 
What are the positions of the people of knowledge? And it's going to give you an understanding on why they chose those positions or if they chose those positions, do you eventually start to incline towards those positions based off of these usul? You see the importance now? Tell you. It's already been there. We've, we've, Sheikh Uthameen, Rahim Azala said that this knowledge is an ocean without a shore. We've all been standing on the shore watching the waves hit the seashore. Nobody getting their feet wet. Nobody getting their feet wet. Now we, we just pushed you off the pier. You're still close to the shore. You tread in water. So this is the thing. Thus far, from what we have taken, from the actions of the Messenger, وسلم, that which he has done upon an avenue of obedience and drawing near and close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the salah is from amongst those avenues. But it is fi'lun mujarrid. There are differences amongst the people of knowledge, how they're going to see that action. To go towards obligation where it does not it does not align isn't going to comfort the heart as Sheikh Uthaymeen Sheikh Fozan Sheikh Al-Islam Ibn Uthaymiyyah they mentioned that that which the Messenger والسلام, has done upon an avenue of drawing near and close to Allah Azawajal. Understanding that He is the example for us. It is like a qadrun mushtarak. It is like a degree that shares between. We don't know if it's obligation. We don't know if it's a recommendation. To raise things to the level of obligation without proof and evidence goes against the usul. We can't go beneath the level of recommendation because he's the example for us to follow. If by default, this is where the button resets you, it puts you on, it's recommended. We're not going to look at it and say, it's not even some, it's mubah. There's no reward in it. No, he's doing it upon an avenue of drawing near to Allah Azza wa Jal. There's reward in it, so it's not mubah. So it's only going to be, if you would say, for argument's sake. Because haram and makru are out the window. So we're only left with wajib, obligation, mustahab, or mandub, recommended, and mubah. For you or not for you. There's no harm. There's, there's nothing against you. We won't even say that now because... This is drawing near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there is something for you. So mubah has now been removed. So haram is off the table. Makruh is off the table. Mubah is off the table. The only thing left is that which is wajib. It's an obligation. And that which is mustahab. It's recommended. Al-aslu bara'atu dhimma. Remember we took that principle? The foundation is, I'm free of all obligations, except with proof and evidence. And the evidence has to be convincing. This is why Shaykh what they mean, when we were doing the work of Sifatul Salat al Nabi, when we got to the affair of the Salat, as Salat al Nabi, in the sitting, in the final sitting, he said Sunnah. Why? Because he, meant, he mentioned in his summarization, he finds it difficult to obligate the servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with an affair. And this was the salah upon the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, in the salah. When the statement could have been for irshad, he just guided them on how to say it. 
and not for with you. That when you sit, you have to say this. Sheikh what they mean, he said, it's possible he could have been talking about this is how you do it, not that you have to do it. He said, with this ihtima, with this possibility, he said, we cannot go towards obligation. And it's not an obligation with Sheikh what they So without looking at that narration from the eye of obligation, where Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she sees the heels of the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam, or she feels his, 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 his feet with her hand, with her one hand, fi'lun mujarrad, mere action, mandub, recommended. In our next class, inshallah ta'ala, or in the following classes, we're going to detail what these affairs are, mustahab mandub, recommended, Rewarded if you do it, empty thalan, dry, trying to draw near and close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No punishment or sin upon you if you don't do it, if your feet are not together. Your feet could be spread. Mukhalifatun li sunnah, it is opposing the sunnah, but we want to say there's no sin on this individual in a situation like this, especially if the individual doesn't know. He just hasn't fulfilled the sunnah. But what is the beauty of all of this? It removes the darkness of ignorance. It brings the light of knowledge. And it brings ease. And it removes hardship. In your life, in my life, first and foremost, then those around us, then those around them, and then those around them. So that now when you build to a level, when this conversation comes full circle and these things start coming, we say, uh-uh. Uh-uh, not here. That was totally wrong. But the people that don't see it, they won't know. And then at times, you yourself may become their fitna. Where you might have to silence yourself. And you say, I'll be eaten alive by the ignorant. Trying to stand on that which is correct and firm. You would say, Yaqi, keep your position to yourself. Because you may wind up causing more harm than good. But know that it's wrong. That position is wrong. Until the time comes, until that awakening comes, like the sister she mentioned when we were having a class, classes ago. She said, what are we going to do with this knowledge now? When we see certain things are not aligning with it, we're going to be patient. We're going to wait until the opportunity comes. Maybe in the interim, the knowledge is going to raise itself where you won't even have to make an announcement or a statement. They may come forward and say, we've been doing something this particular way. We're going to do it this, this way moving forward. And everybody sits and looks at each other and says, wow. You see? This is going to come in the next class. The next class, we're not going to open this door yet. The next class, this is what's going to come. Mujmalun. This is something like you deal with that which is am, khas, mutlaq. Muqayyid, Mujmal, Mubayyin. That which is Mujmal is something that is in need of clarification and explanation. That is the responsibility of the Messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam. This here, does it have no explanation? Like the Shaykh he mentioned, Lam yurid bihi qawl. There's no statement that came with the siwak when he came into the house. When you enter your house, utilize the siwak. It's just a mere action that he did. There are a lot of things that the Messenger of Allah, alayhi salatu I'm going to give you an example. And this is under what's coming in terms of kitab al-tahara, bab al-wudu. And this is for everybody. Just an eye-opener. And it, it pertains to everybody because the wudu of the male and the female is the same. There were some issues of concern with some of the scholars concerning the salat. Certain aspects of the salat are a little different. The wudu is the same. So 
when making the wudu, you're washing your hand, you run your hand under the faucet. It's completely wet from fingertip to elbow and slightly beyond the elbow, which is what is supposed to happen. You go slightly beyond the elbow. But you don't touch it. You don't rub it. All you did was you roll back your sleeves. Now you take some water, you move towards the head. Somebody sees you from the side. He says, I tell you, you got to wash your hands. I said, I wash my hands. He said, you just ran the water over. You got to wash it. What do we say? What do we say? It's now an issue of your wudu is not correct or your wudu is correct. Faqsilu wujuhakum wa aidiyakum ilal marafiq. Wash your faces and your hands to the elbows and until the elbows, meaning including the elbows. That's why I'm saying you're going slightly beyond it. But the individual, all he or she did was move back the sleeves. They say, I'm moving quick. I'm against the clock. From fingertip to elbow and slightly beyond. Water all the way down. Both sides all over. Nothing left dry. The other hand. Same thing. Brother next to you sees that. Sister next to you sees that. Sister, you got to wash that. What do you mean? Why? I just washed it. You got to wash that. That's, is that how you wash when you get in the shower? They say you got to wash. What's the understanding of this? This, this? this discussion. Because what's happening now. This is what's really happening to the look, which is this. You're rubbing. You're rubbing the skin now. You're rubbing the skin with the water on it to wash. That's what we're going to say, quote unquote, wash. I've already utilized the water. And I've ran it over the article that's narrated by text. So I've utilized the water. I've utilized the article that said the water has to be utilized with in the order, the fashion, the manner. I just didn't rub. Somebody sees that and they say, okay, you can't do this. Say it to the sister downstairs too. I said, man, you know what? I don't know if my wudu is correct. No, I, I, I didn't rub. What is the correct position? Does the wudu sound or not? They did everything else the traditional way that you know. So we're not going to entertain. Because maybe something what is traditional with you is not traditional. But just right now, is, is the wudu of this person sound or not? No. I like this answer, but you know what my pushback is? That's a gosel. There's no order for the gosel. I could start at my feet for a gosel. <sighs> you up to three now. That's the sunnah, right? You said, he said, I had to make it witter. You up to three pieces of homework now, Shay. Yes, yes, for your benefit, for your benefit. The ghusl is the washing of the body. The particular order and sequence is from the sunnah. You can start from the toes if you want it. With the wudu, it's narrated by the ayat a order. You can't break that. That's not the ghusl. So now we're back to the wudu. But I pushed back on your position. And I said, the analysis that you were making, I've cut it in half. And said the piece that you were utilizing of the analysis it doesn't carry over to the wudu. This is the qiyas. So I showed you now qiyas ma'al fara. You were making an analogy, but there's a separation. And I showed you where the separation is. Exactly. So now where are we at? Back to the conversation of is the wudu sound or not? Because there's no tadalluk. There's no rubbing now. But you utilize the water. You, it, it covered every portion of 
the head, right? Fogsilu. Is that a washing? Hmm? That's not a washing. What is the washing? Fogsilu. <clears throat> Is going that Fogsilu Mujma. Who's going to clarify this generality? The Messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam. Right? In the wudu of the Messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam, did he rub? Huh? You see how we're tying it all together now? Fi'l al Mujarid. Obligatory? Recommended. So if we go as recommend say, okay, you missed the aspect of the sunnah, there's no sin. Is my wudu sound? It is. Because I've washed it. That affair of tadalluq, actually washing the body part with your hand, your other body part, whatever the situation is, is from the sunnah. It's not obligatory. It's this is where you're going to start to your scope of the sunnah, the boundaries of what you're determining, defining as sunnah, obligations within the sunnah. It's going to start, it's like a, it's going to be like a kaleidoscope. It's going to continually move now because you're going to start seeing things that I'm going to have to shift. That piece, no, put that here. That piece, no, put that here. That, take it out of the board. That, I didn't know it was there. Bring it in now. Bring it in now, but where do you put it? This is where the scope, and we mentioned what you see as sunnah coming from his actions, his statements, his approval. And this is just one category. There's still speech and approval still left. Within Af'al, this is the only category that still remains. It is. It's a sunnah. It's, it's, it's a recommended aspect of the performance of your wudu. If the individual, he says, I have a particular faucet that if I make wudu and I'm washing my face, other than the affair of tamadmad, wastin chak, you're putting the water in your mouth and your nose. And we're trying to do it with one hand at the same time. We're not trying to split. Right? But this is a major issue. Major issue. Trying to do both at the same time. It's going to be a major issue and discussion amongst the people of knowledge, but individuals who are splitting. Major. So you're trying to get mouth, nose, same time. That's what you're shooting for. But he says, my particular faucet allows me to wash my face. I don't even have to use my hands. Then he says, because of that, that, that fixture, I can do my hands the same way. So I'm going to rub my head, my ears, but I can do my feet the same way. So I'm really only rubbing my head with the ears, and I'm only utilizing my hand to enter water into my mouth and my nose. Outside of that, I never touch myself. What is the condition of my wudu? So we'll go back. To the look is a recommended aspect of performing your wudu. It's not an obligatory aspect. Your wudu is still resting upon soundness if everything else was sound. But that, that aspect is off the table. Because it's fi'l al If you have a narration that says when you perform the do, rub. That's a, action, that's a statement with the action. It's a different thing. But a lot of this is taken from fi'l al so everybody, if you can, go back to the work of Sheikh Al-Abani. Find me three affairs of Fi'l al Just three mere actions that he did that he did not tell you by statement to do inside of the Salat. Look and see what is the position of Sheikh Al-Abani associated with that position. And then when you bring it back, because we've covered this, this is familiar for the most part amongst all of us. We'll start to see how these things were now aligning. And you will start to see that that aspect, that's a major aspect of the salah. It's a fi'l al-mujarid. It's, it's a sunnah. We don't have his feet together. It's a fi'l al-mujarid. It's mustahad.
طيب هذا وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى اله واصحابه اجمعين سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك اشهد ان لا اله الا انت استغفرك واتوب اليك السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته Amen.